On today's episode of Locked On Canucks, we are at the eve of NHL free agency. So today, just for all of you, a full in-depth dive into what the Canucks will do tomorrow at the beginning of free agency, what they won't do, and who are the biggest names in free agency and where will they go. It's Locked On Canucks on a Tuesday, July the 12th, and it starts now. Your Locked On Canucks, your daily podcast on the Vancouver Canucks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Locked On Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. I'm, of course, your host, Justin Cooney. I hope you guys are doing well today. It's the eve of NHL free agency, which gets underway tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific time. And, of course, rumors are swirling about what is going to happen with all the biggest names. Johnny Goudreau. What about Evgeny Malkin? Goaltenders being swapped. We saw Jack Campbell is most likely out of Toronto as Matt Murray comes in. Cam Talbot is now in Ottawa. What is going to happen over the next 24 hours or 40 hours is going to be wild but we have to start first by thanking you for making locked on canucks your first listen of the day we of course are free and available wherever you get your podcast services guys a busy 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 time ahead if you are a vancouver canucks fan because not only is prospect development camp underway but as i mentioned free agency is tomorrow so this first block is all going to be dedicated to what the Canucks will do when free agency opens up. Um, as this currently stands, the Canucks' needs are this. They need a third-line center. They need help on the right side of defense. They need more speed, skill, uh, you know, in the bottom half of their lineup. And they need it now. And they need to shed cap space because they only have $6.4 million of that aforementioned cap space. And Michael Furlan and his $3.5 million salary, you could thank him for that, is going to be you know helping that cap space up. Jim Rutherford uh, talked to uh, reporters saying that they haven't cleared as much cap space as they hope to, basically saying that uh, you need to give up assets to clear cap space. The Canucks don't have, are not in the position to give up assets to uh, gain cap space. They're trying to build assets, which... Uh, we can all think, thank Jim Benning for. Um, the Canucks will, of course, have $2.4 million in a dead cap space because uh, they bought out Braden Holpe uh, and Jake Vertanen last year. Also, uh, they have the $1.25 million signing bonus uh, for Yaroslav Halak that he signed last year. They can create another additional $5.25 million of caps by trading JT Miller. Uh, but that hasn't materialized yet. And as Jim Rutherford has been very adamant saying there is no deadline to trade JT Miller at this particular moment. And of course, beating this horse for the last however many months, the Canucks will either A, trade him for the best deal they can get, or they will sign him to a new contract extension. One of those two will get done because it would be absolute lunacy, absolute lunacy, if JT Miller comes back to Vancouver without a new deal or is not traded, to have that hanging over the franchise would be very bad. And I know Jim Rutherford is saying there is no pressure. They can keep him till a month before the deadline. Well, damn it, if a month before the deadline and JT and the Canucks are in a playoff spot and you don't know if JT Miller is going to re-sign, you're running the risk of losing him for nothing. And that could be a risk that a team like the Canucks cannot make. This franchise has uh, is on thin ice right now. This summer is pivotal. They've done great things so far, getting Andre Kuzmenko, getting Brock Besser re-signed at a decent deal. They're going to get Bo Horvat re-signed. Um, the draft was very successful. Uh, they brought in a good coaching staff. A lot of positives, but this right here, this free agency period, this JT Miller potential trade or extension, is going to be massive because if they re-sign JT Miller, it's a win. 
If they trade JT Miller for the right package, it's a win. If they sign JT Miller for a long-term extension for at market value, that's an L. If they don't trade JT Miller and lose him eventually for lesser value or no value, that is an L. So what Jim Rutherford and Patrick Avin do to figure out this whole JT Miller elephant and build the raw is going to be critical. What the free agents the Canucks could sign? Well, there's like I said, the the money's not there to do much, right? You have guys like Carl Yonkro, uh, the 30 year old Swede who can play center. Um, he made two million last year. Um, he had 12 goals for 30 points in 66 games. He was acquired by Calgary as a rental. Uh, he had one goal, eight points in 29 games with the Flames last regular season and playoffs. Um, I would stick away from Carl Yonkro. I'm not a big fan back when he was in Nashville. Uh, there's Vladislav Nemestikov, a journeyman Russian who has you know played more wing than center. Um, he's handy. He scored 16 goals and had 30 points last year in Dallas and Detroit. He's a former first-round pick, so he has that pedigree. Um, and he just finished making two million bucks. Then there's Ilya Labushkin, a right-hand defenseman uh, from Toronto. I know I said before I'd really rather Canucks go after Ilya Mikheyev, uh, but he's probably going to get some stupid money because he just came off a 21-goal season, and he's probably going to get a fat contract. Labushkin, though, uh, he played last year on a 1.35 million dollar offer. Uh, I think he could get him around the same. Uh, he's got a good size, can handle the puck, make a pass, but he's a bottom rotation defenseman. Victor Rask, another center who could probably step in. Um, he had a, he's coming off a six-year deal. Um, he spent time in the American Hockey League, kind of a you know falling off. Um, he's not going to make four million. You probably get him on the cheap, and it might be a low-cost gamble for them. But that's kind of what we're talking about for the Canucks. Those bottom line guys, those you know fringe defensemen, those you know bottom six forwards, with what they're going to get for what the cap space they have and what they can do unless they can clear space. And I don't think anybody's going to be taking a Jason Dickinson contra- contract or a Tanner Pearson contract. Nobody sure as hell is going to touch Tyler Myers or OEL's contract. So what do they do? Well, there's not much you can do. You have your top six cemented and whether JT Miller is... If JT Miller is in Vancouver, which it looks like it, as the days go on, more and more likely... Um, your top six is set. Your bottom six, you're going to have to rely on guys like Jason Dickinson, Tanner Pearson uh, to step up, and then you're just going for bottom of the bale fishing. Um, I don't think we should expect splashy moves from the Canucks at all, um, which might be a good thing. You know, the Canucks before under Jim Benning made some you know splashy moves during free agency and case in point. Louis Erickson, Jay Beagle, Antoine Roussel, Tucker Pullman, Tyler Myers, whoever – OEL. Uh, splashy moves might not be the, the case for the Canucks. And that is not a bad thing. Sometimes playing it safe and quiet might be the best way, course of action because you're not reaching. You're not making a deal for the sake of making a deal. So tomorrow, I don't expect a lot from the Canucks. Uh, I did say yesterday that I think a Horvat extension does get announced uh, either tomorrow or sometime this week. Um, potentially a Miller extension. So that might be the biggest news to come this week is a Bo Horvat extension announcement um, that I think it's been very quiet on that front. So when it's quiet with this Canucks management group, something's bound to happen. So uh, I think a Horvat extension should be getting done shortly and will be announced hopefully sometime this week. That's just me playing a hunch. I don't have any insider scoops. I'm just playing a hunch that Bo Horvat's deal will get done. Uh, Coming up after this break, I want to dive into the rest of free agency. And I want to talk about some of the other big names and where they might end up. Because, yes, the Canucks have a lot to do. But also, these moves that might take place over the next 24 hours can shape what the Canucks will do. So, after this break, we're going to take a look, a broader look at the NHL's uh, free agency. And, I guess, how it affects the Vancouver Canucks. So, stick around for that. But first, I want to talk to you guys about the fine folks at Built. From the people who invented healthy and tasty comes the latest gift to your taste buds. You've probably tried the amazing coconut brownie chunk Built Bar. But guess what? Your friends at Built Bar 
I've given the coconut brownie chunk the puffs treatment. That is right. The coconut brownie chunk built bar flavor you love in a deliciously chewy marshmallow covered in 100% real chocolate. It's like a fluffy cloud of coconut brownie goodness, but stop drooling and listen. There are good for you, low calorie, low sugar, high protein, and all delicious. Coconut brownie chunk puffs are here for only a limited time. So go to built.com now to make sure you don't miss out. They're going fast because they taste amazing. All built bars are made with collagen protein, which your body absorbs more efficiently and provides tons of health benefits. Eat something that tastes good and is good for you. The best part about Built Puffs is, of course, they taste amazing. But you can enjoy them guilt-free because they're actually good for you. They're the perfect treat, perfect when you got a crepe and when you need to satisfy your sweet tooth. Or if you only need a quick, healthy snack, they're an excellent source of protein. Delicious coconut, rich, sweet, brownie, creamy marshmallow. Stop fantasizing. Get to Built.com to order your box of chocolate, excuse me, coconut brownie chunk Built Puffs right now. Go to built.com, use promo code locked15 to get 15% off your order. Once again, use promo code locked15. And welcome back to Locked On Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. So let's talk about NHL free agency and what is going to be transpiring over the next 24 hours. Is where do the big names go on the chessboard and how does that affect the Canucks plans? So first things first, the biggest fish in the market, Johnny Goudreau uh, informed the Calgary Flames. He will not be returning to Cowtown. Uh, apparently, according to Frank Cervelli, it was an emotional conversation for both sides. Uh, they rolled the red carpet for him and massive offer was presented, but this deal was not worth the money. Um, people were saying that it was like a, you know, eight year, uh, north of $10 million offer and he turned it down. And so what happens now with Johnny Goudreau and where does he go? Where do the flames go? Because that does affect the Canucks because that is their division rival. So I said, Johnny Goudreau probably goes out East to Philly. Um, I said yesterday, maybe John Tortorella and Philly, um, get on the Goudreau sweep They need to clear some money, but He's from that area. It would fit well. He could go to Jersey, um, but I see Goudreau, you know, maybe wanting to win. If it's not about the money and he's turned down, you know, 10 plus million dollars, it must be because he wants to win. So, you know, maybe it's Philly, maybe it's Carolina, sorry, Jersey, or maybe, excuse me, is Carolina, a team that, you know, can is losing some contracts, but can add Goudreau in. Or maybe a little bit less than what he's going to turn down in Calgary, but a better chance to win. And still, in East, that move, if that move transpires to whatever one of the teams I just mentioned, the very big roster. They're losing a guy that just had this season. They're losing one of the next Matthew Kachuk. How do the they're probably going to have to resign Matthew Kachuk and offer him a boatload of money just so he stays the rest of the roster pan out go after nas codger do they go after um somebody else that void um calgary's not a huge free agent destination so the flames are in big trouble if they now that they lose johnny goodrow um they're gonna have a big void to fill and this kind of smells the end of calgary's playoff there'll be a might be a playoff team but their cup contention status uh, is gone. It's done. If jo- once Johnny Goudreau leaves, you have Matthew Kachuk, but you're not going to get that same equal value for um, that same. You're not going to get somebody who put the same production to fill his shoes. You're not going to get that, right? Then we go to Nas Kadri, the aforementioned Nas Kadri, where reports are indicating that his deal uh, will be eight million bucks. Um, now Nas Kadri is a good player, had a great playoffs and stuff like that, but he's not worth. Eight million dollars. If JT Miller is getting offered seven and a half to eight, that's a bargain for him. Nas Kadri at an eight million is a huge overpay. Good for him though. He's gonna get his money dealt with a lot. Shoved it up to the Leafs' ass uh, after he got um, after they won the Stanley Cup. Excuse me, uh, but he's gonna get paid. I don't know if he's worth that much, but some fool 
We'll pay him money. I don't know if it's going to be Washington or if it's going to be uh, Boston, New York. Somebody will pay him a lot of money. We go up north to Edmonton where Evander Kane is a free agent. Um, and who knows where he's going to land. If I'm Evander Kane, I stay in Edmonton and play shotgun with Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl. And I make my four and a half million bucks for four years. And I pile up the points and I have a chance to win. Now, speaking of the Oilers as well, I believe they're the most likely suitor for Jack Campbell. They'll probably offer him a you know five, six year deal worth, you know, six million, maybe five of five and a half north to six million, which in my opinion is a huge overpay for Jack Campbell because he has never played over 50 games in a season. He's never done anything in the playoffs, that's for sure. Why would you, what warrants him to make six million bucks a year? Darcy Kemper is probably going to make a boatload of money uh, come this free agency period. Probably a six for six term. Uh, he's not the he's not a number one goalie, a number one A goalie. He's probably a one B. Um, same with Jack Campbell, but the market dictates that's what these guys will get paid. So with all these moves and all these the, all these big contracts being doled out, we resort back to the Canucks and how I was said it before. This might be good for the Canucks to just take a step back and see other teams blow their money, you know, sign with the big deals. That will cause teams that miss out to be desperate and bring up the asking price for potential JT Miller trade, which could then bring the, Can- the Canucks some assets that they can build this roster, free up some cap space. Or quite frankly, I'm wrong, and they just keep JT Miller and they resign him to an extension. And then we go to St. Louis, where Vladimir Tarasenko, who's coming off, you know, requesting a trade a year ago, um, but, you know, stuck with St. Louis because he was coming off injuries, his value was low, had a great year, his value's back up. Where does the winger go? Does he go to maybe in New York or somewhere out east, or does he come out west? That's another domino that has to fall. Uh, Tarasenko could, you know, influence the JT Miller trade market because, uh, they're very similar players. They're very high-end players. So if Tarasenko gets goes for a haul, that might reset the market for what JT Miller could go for. Um, but coming up after the break, I want to dive into the Chicago Blackhawks and what they're doing and how they potentially could screw this up more than the Canucks did. So stick around for that. And welcome back to Locked On Canucks, the show that keeps you locked in on all things Vancouver Canucks. So we always get on the Canucks here in Vancouver about how they've screwed up a rebuild, how you know they've been stuck in the mud for years, um, and how nothing has come of it. But let's take a look at the Chicago Blackhawks and what's going on there. Um, you look at this franchise who had you know won three cups in five years, had a dynasty that should have kept on going, um, but then. You know, they trade people out due to cap concerns. They were a cap-heavy team. You had the whole Kyle Beach scandal, which was an absolute disgusting act by this organization um, and all the people involved in that. And now you look at them. Seth Jones' new contract uh, this year. He just signed a brand-new fat-ticket deal. I'm sure he did not sign up for a rebuild. Patrick Kane is still in his prime, and I don't know if he wants to rebuild. And if you saw... The comments his agent made last week after they traded Alex DeBrincat for not equal value for, I'd say, you know, quarters on, or dimes on the dollar um, and his best friend on the team, Patrick Kane might request a trade. Um, it would be very interesting to see where if Patrick Kane were to request a trade from Chicago and where he would go and just the amount of suitors that would line up for him. We think about JT Miller suitors. I think 31 other teams would line up to get Patrick Kane on their roster because that's how box office he is. And Canucks fans, we know front and center. But the Blackhawks are a prime example. And I think this, the Penguins will eventually hit this too. When your star players get to that certain age and they cannot produce anymore and you give up all those assets, it's not pretty. And it's not going to look pretty in Chicago anytime soon. They've stripped this thing down. Pretty, They're not going to be a good team next year. They're going to rebuild. They're going to take this franchise, you know, back to where it was before Kane and Taves, where there was nobody at the United Center. There was no fan base. Um, and it's worrisome. But if you think about it, would you rather, when you hindsight, if you were a Canucks fan, right, would you rather 
the Canucks do what they did, try to patchwork it and not get anywhere, or strip it down and have the worst level of success and just be have no optimism whatsoever. But then you have a hope to get a first round pick. But it's not a guarantee. It's interesting to see how this all plays out. Um, so I want to talk about that and see and pose a question to all of you. How would you go about it? Do you feel that Chicago is doing it right by stripping it all down? Or if you still have Kane and Taves, do you still try to piece it together and try to be competitive? So let me know what you guys think about that in the comment section below. Uh, of course, tomorrow is NHL free agency. So we will be locked in on all of that on the Locked On Podcast Network. Um, I want to thank you for making Locked On Canucks your first listen every day. Tomorrow, we will have a full recap of free agency day one. Now, I want you to make your second listen, Locked On NHL. Locked On experts give you a daily 30-minute podcast on all things NHL all year long. Stay up to date on everything in the hockey world. Your Locked On NHL podcast is, your excuse me, Locked On NHL, your daily 30-minute podcast. Take care, guys. Stay safe. I will talk to you tomorrow.